All right, welcome everyone to the, uh, let's see, August 6th, Aries Cloud Agent Python user group meeting. A um, couple of quick reminders. Uh, this is a Hyperledger call, so the Hyperledger code of conduct is in effect. Uh, this is also a Linux Foundation call, so remember the uh, Linux Foundation's antitrust policy. Um, Steven is unable to attend today, so he asked me to step in to host, um, which I am happy to do, of course. Um, uh, we've got a, a pretty good agenda, um, mostly focused on releases and um, a bit of a review of the did TDW work since that was cut a little bit short during our last meeting. Uh, and then we'll look at some open PRs and issues. Um, feel free to queue up PRs and issues that you'd like to bring up. Um, I think we will have plenty of time in our meeting today for it. Um, with that, are there any announcements before we get going? Would anybody like to introduce themselves as well? Well, uh, I, I got my hand raised, so I will go ahead. Yep. Um, just would like to talk a little bit about did web. So part of some work I'm doing where we have a requirement for did web and I've been looking into a, a did web server um, project from IdentiNet, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm currently looking for a integration between Akapai and this did web server. And the idea would be to have a, a sort of a did web endorser. Um, yeah, so I made a bit of exploration. I have a, I have a pretty good grasp of how it works and how I want to implement it in Akapai, so I can go over this. Um, it's sort of similar to the TDW discussion. You know, TDW yeah. did web, they're never too far apart. So this could probably uh, influence some decision making. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be good. That definitely um, applies to uh, the, the TDW discussion as well. Um, yeah, I think that would be great. Cool. Does anybody else have any uh, announcements or would like to introduce themselves or have something to add on to our agenda today? All right. So let's go ahead and start talking about release 1.0. Um, so release candidate six was just published, um, let's see, a couple days ago, Friday. Uh, don't recall exactly when. Um, and this is what we expect to be the final release before we get to uh, the, the, the final, or the final release candidate before we get to the final 1.0 release. Um, I think the major change in, in RC6 is the inclusion of the long-term long support policy PR, which included some documentation updates, um, especially. Um, Let's see, other things to bring up for the 1.0 RC6. Um, in case you haven't been following, uh, there are a number of, of changes to the images themselves. Um, the underlying Python version for this upcoming release will be 3.12 instead of 3.9, which was the version that we were previously targeting. Um, and in addition to that, the BBS signatures support um, is being, we're taking a bit of a different tactic with that because uh, the BBS dependency that we are currently using requires, uh, or rather does not have a build for ARM architecture. So using it on M1 requires you to jump through a few hoops. Um, so to help avoid that and, and ease development on Actify in the future, um, and especially considering that this particular iteration of BBS signatures is not the same as the, the current discussions for like uh, support for BBS in BCGI um, and in other contexts. Um, so this extra has been excluded from the build for the time being, and it can be manually added back in in your own Docker images if you would like. Um, but yeah, the, the default image for Actify will not include the BBS extra. Um, are there any other questions Comments, things to bring up for the 1.0 release pending? 
So uh, just regarding the ARM structure, so if I understand correctly, I can use the published image, uh, Docker image, and just run this on an ARM device without having to build the image myself. Is that is that it? Right. Um, there was a workaround previously where you could specify the platform, like in your your Docker run command or in your Docker compose, and you could tell it to yeah. run uh, on x86 on M1. Um, but yeah, that introduced you know complexity and challenges, especially with like dev containers and development environments. Um, so yeah, um, the official image should be runnable on M1 without any uh, platform flags. That's good. Yeah. Um, not, a, not a Mac person myself, but uh, it's good nonetheless. Yeah, indeed. So the the main focus on on this release candidate is to just get some testing time in. Um, it goes through the Aries Agent Test Harness. Um, and if you have deployments, uh, test environments that you'd like to get some time in before the official 1.0 release is out, we would greatly appreciate your feedback um, to help make this a, a solid release. Let's see. There were also a couple of other releases recently um, to um, a couple of past versions of ActPy. So there was the 0.12.2 release, uh, which is basically 0.12.1 with these PRs cherry picked over from the main branch. Uh, most of these PRs have to do with uh, just small bug fixes and interoperability fixes. Um, for example, the uh, multi-use invitations, there was an issue with the tier four um, that was causing them to, to break down. Uh, there's also a number of, of credo interop fixes that have been made as well, like responding to the tier one with the tier four and uh, fixing overly strict validation in the JSON-LD implementation in ActPy to enable uh, uh, link data proof PCs to be exchanged between ActPy and credo. Uh, there was also a Could you, um, Sorry, just quickly the the strict validation that do you know was there a lot it was just like a few a few things uh, uh, it was a pretty small set of changes there there were like yeah just oh yeah I did okay yeah I, I did comment them. on there yeah, yeah. It, so it, it was a very small. Um, I think if I'm if I remember correctly, it wasn't so much in the JSON LD, but more in the exchange protocol, right? Like the exchange. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So this was in like the diff presentation exchange. It was like the uh, diff handler. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, to do with right. the UID and stuff. Okay. Yep. Indeed. I remember. Yeah. Um, let's see. We also had the zero eleven three release come out this just had um, a fix for uh, overly terse webhooks. Um, so th this enables you to completely exchange uh, in presentations exchange, especially, I think, um, where if you had, uh, if you leave off the debug webhook flag, there wasn't enough information to actually completely exchange before it was automatically deleted from the wallet. Uh, so that was fixed for the 011x line of releases. Uh, so those that's our current release status. Are there any questions? Uh, I don't have a question toward the release. Uh, maybe a sort of discussion opinion. Uh, moving forward, once 1.0 is released, how, um, like how open is the group going to be towards uh, breaking change, you know, for a post 1.0 release and start to uh, aim to a 2.0 release. Like um, definitely since the Occupy project started, a lot of standards have evolved and there's new specification that's been made. And I'm thinking about things like uh, multi-base, multi-key, you know, for uh, public key representation and things like this. And just the way that Occupy you know, the whole did creation process, I think this is something that we'll want to have a look at to, you, you know, the relationship between key pairs to improve it a little bit and how um, 
supportive is the the group towards breaking change moving forward from 1.0 release yeah um i can say at least speaking from my own opinions on, on the matter I, I think having the lts policy in place actually enables us to start making bigger changes in like the the upcoming uh long-term service releases so um when a 2.0 release comes out we won't immediately jump to marking it as an LTS, we'll, we'll probably go through a couple of rounds of iteration, minor version updates. Um, and then once mm -hmm. we're comfortable with the stability and, and the set of features that are included in it, then we can mark it as an LTS. So I, I think with that, um, that enables us to be a little bit more aggressive with, um, you know, removing deprecated protocols, because if they need, if users need those protocols, they can always go to, uh, the, you know, the 1.0 LTS or um, I think we've also marked a couple of other um, pre 1.0 releases as long-term service. Um, yeah, so I, I'm I, hopeful that'll help us eliminate a little bit more quickly some of those. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense because there seems to be like more and more interest in like the web, you know, TDW, uh, JSON LD credentials, and um, the way it's been currently set up, it doesn't make that super convenient. Um, yeah. and I think with some minor change, uh, could be made a lot better for everyone. Cool. Yeah, for sure. So does anybody else have any thoughts on that question? Um, not really thoughts, but, um, I think like you can possibly have like breaking changes in minor upgrades to, um, like if there's specific stuff to a protocol, we like lots of libraries out there have breaking changes with minor upgrades. So like, uh, going to two would be like a major, major change, but we can still have breaking changes in minor upgrades, in my opinion, like as long as they're well, as long as it's obvious what you have to do. Um, and then another thing is just once we get one released, I'd really like to try to have a more consistent release schedule. So we're doing minor releases, like at least kind of like once a month and stuff to get this stuff out quicker. Because yeah, just with our LTS and everything, like, uh, I think. I think it's set up better for um, like higher velocity releases now too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I agree with that. Um, we've definitely had a tendency towards, well, we got to get this one last thing in to this release and, and, and it just pushes back and pushes back a little bit further at a time. Um, and now it's one year later. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I think I, everything's I really... set up better for it now for sure. Yeah, agreed. And I think it would be great to have consistent releases, consistent minor releases. Are we, uh, I don't know if this has been discussed, but are we going to maintain, uh, along with the LTS support for the version, are we going to maintain version documentation? Yes. Uh, Steven's away this week, but... So he didn't know that better, but he, we have documentation back to 11. Uh, I think even okay. further, but he plans on having documentation for the LTS versions until they're retired. Yeah, I think that's great. Thank you. Uh, anything else on ActPy releases? OK. Uh, next in line is uh, just wrapping up the did TDW discussion. Um, we started this off at the very end of, of the last call. Um, we've got some other really good things to discuss. I'd, I'd really like to hear about the did web server, what you have to say on that, Patrick. 
Um, so I, I don't want to take up too much of our time on this. Um, so I'll start off with a reminder that this design doc is here. It's not really super thorough at this point. It's just the beginning of getting these ideas down on paper. Um, and then we can start iterating on, on the process and start iterating on getting some changes into Actify as well. Um, some of these are, are rather opinionated. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on these opinions. Um, as a very, very brief recap, um, I think we should start a, a pattern of doing slash did slash did method endpoints. Um, and then that can be our, our kind of universal resolver or not resolver, registrar interface for creating dids uh, where it's just conventions uh, of, uh, you know, if we want to create a did tdw, we do slash did slash tdw. If we wanted to do a, a I don't know, a did indie, we would have did indie create. Um, and then all the operations around doing updates or, or doing other operations necessary for a particular did method can live under the slash did slash method um, paths. Um, yeah, so for did tdw, um, I think rather than giving granular control over the creation of, of particular keys and inclusion into a did doc, same with services, um, we can certainly go that direction and, and provide granular support if it's necessary. But I think in general, what we care about with, with these dids is uh, basically checking which features we want this particular did to support. So having like a, a toggle for, for um, including the necessary pieces for did comp v1 or v2, um, a non-creds and uh, VCDI and such. Um, I think by just toggling these flags, we can construct a did document without requiring the controller to be concerned about the minutia of verification methods and services and making sure we're using references in the right spot and, and embedded it, verification methods and, and whatever. Um, I think that just provides a cleaner interface for the controller. Um, so that's that's my proposal for our creation of these methods, uh, of these dids with the TDW method. Resolver is very straightforward. Um, okay, so this is the, the point I was really hoping to come to today. Uh, it's just bringing up key management. Um, in particular, the concept of a ver key within ActPy right now. Um, so right now uh, when we create a did uh, we create this did info object which has associated with it a singular key and that key is identified by uh, the base 58 encoding of the public key this concept like kind of makes sense for the ed255 19 keys there's still some ambiguity even in ed255 19 in terms of like what that data is representing um, but uh, whether it's like the compact form or, or the compressed form or whatever it's called, I don't remember exactly. Um, so you just kind of had to know exactly what the ver key represented. And that was also the, the, the value that we used to identify the key within the wallet. So if we wanted to perform uh, a signature over a message, uh, we provide uh, to the, the signing interface the ver key. Um, which is then used to look up the private component inside of Ascar or, or whatever wallet backend, and then performs the signature with the private key. Um, again, Verki as, uh, as a key identifier makes some sense with ED25519, but with other key types, it's a little less clear what those identifiers should be and what they represent. Um, so this isn't new necessarily, we've talked about this before, but um, I think we need to move ActPy to identifying keys by a verification method ID. Um, so the keys themselves are independently resolvable from the wallet by these identifiers, and it also provides a clear binding between did and the keys that make up the did document. Um, there there is some nuance to that though. Um, so for example, in our, our didcom v1 implementation within ActPy right now, uh, 
the packaging of messages is dependent on using a Verti as the ID in the wallet. Unpacking is the same. Um, however, the, the inbound key to did to connection lookup that we perform in order to provide the context of, of what connection is messaging us is not currently dependent on using the Verti as the ID in the wallet. Uh, neither is outbound messaging. Um, that now natively supports DIDs and DID documents and resolving those DID documents to determine the key material and, and the endpoints and everything. Um, uh, Patrick, you have your hand up. I'm thinking if just switching to, uh, instead of a ver key, you have a multi public key multi-base value of that would solve a lot of these problems. Uh, that's a fair question. Um, it's making an assumption that, you, you know, because multi-key is used in a lot of data integrity suites, um, and it's basically the same as a did key, right? So if you have your multi-key, from this multi-key, you can easily create a did key uh, that's sort of implicit, and you could easily just parse the did document to find the public key multi-base value that matches uh, what's in your wallet. Um, just a, an idea. I, I feel like for me, having the base 58 encoded ver key sh should you know, be deprecated in, in favor of a multi-key representation. Like I see this as a quick short-term solution. Mm. Um, the other alternative is what we've been discussing for a while is to associate verification method ID, which um, I, I, not that I say that I think that the second option would give a lot more flexibility for controllers and people yeah. using it. Um, yeah, for yeah. so we've recently been in the details of, of key lookup and dids. Um, with the initial DITCOM v2 support, the experimental DITCOM v2 support that uh, we got merged recently. Um, and what we found is that when you're talking more quote unquote DIT native stuff, um, like DITCOM v2 uh, actually you know, addresses messages by DID as opposed to by keys, um, having the lookup by verification method ID was what we really needed. Um, not by the, the key material that was included um, in the message. It's it's because it's a did that's included in the message, a did and a verification method ID. Um, so yeah, I think I agree with you uh, on the, the point that you came around to, that the verification method ID as the identifier for the key in the wallet probably provides us the greatest flexibility and, and the most use in terms of um, you know, uh, unambiguously it... identifying keys for things like signing theses and sending messages. I, did come to. I feel like it provides more flexibility at the cost of making automation more uh, difficult. Does that make sense? Um. Could you elaborate on that? What automation do you think would become more difficult? Uh, well, I'm thinking like, you know, the exchange protocol of DIDCOM. If I'm thinking the options like auto accept, you know, like these sort of, like the automation at the agent level, not at the controller level, like the controller can, you, you know, do whatever system it wants. But for, for the agent, like I'm thinking the, in your example, so for did the, um, the, the DIDCOM v2, you bind a verification method ID that works because you associate one verification method ID. But if all of a sudden you have multiple verification method ID, would that make that a bit more complicated to, to know which one to use or does it not affect it? Um, at least in the case of the DIDCOM v2 messages, because the, the uh, messages are addressed specifically to a verification method ID, to a, a, a mm -hmm. URL, um, it's unambiguous which key should okay. be used to unpack the message. So do, um, do you have like a, a static ID that you use or? For like, like the, the, the fragment portion of the did URL, you mean? 
Yeah, yeah, the fragment portion. Uh, well, the the full did URL reference is directly embedded in messages being received. Um, on the outbound, okay. when we're like hacking a message to a did, if we just have a did that we want to send a message to, and we're not necessarily particularly concerned with which verification method it goes to, if there are multiple, um, then there's uh, a routine that just essentially picks the first valid verification method ID and then uses that one. And what do you define if it's valid or not? Like what's the uh, the condition to, to determine that? Um, so did come be to specify that uh, the, the identification key is uh, um, in the authentication relationship, I believe. Um, I might be speaking okay. a bit. I might be off. Uh, I haven't thought about this in a minute, so I might be off. Um, and then it also expects an X two fifty five nineteen key to be in. Um, okay. Uh, in the one of the other relationships that's currently escaping me. Um, encryption. Is that a? That's not like a verification method relationship, but um, anyways. Fair enough. I just think like the more options you provide, uh, the less streamlined the things become, right? And the more sort of decision making points need to happen in the exchange. Yeah. Um. So which one is best? Uh, I don't know, right? Like, uh, especially with the web, like you know, if I want, I can have a hundred verification method. You know, right. like fair enough. Like that's not a probably not the the most clever design unless like i don't know there's not some edge case uh but yeah you know like uh, as soon as i get two uh two verification method of the same type uh, i feel like it kind of complicates things a little bit um when it comes to streamlining yeah some kind of interaction yeah and so this kind of mm -hmm. comes back to the pr that was opened up recently that enables um doing did web signatures over uh, JSON LD credentials, um, where uh, the contributor added. But uh, that, that was specifically for presentation. presentation, right? Like this was kind of sorted for issuance by having an options field that you could explicitly right. define a verification method ID. But yeah, this is a good example of what I'm saying like this, because when you, create your issue your credential offer you from the start the issuer can provide the verification method id like when they start the whole exchange the sign presentation happens in the middle of the exchange um, and it's usually initiated by the verifier and it's the holder that's going to decide which verification method id to use based on something that matches what the verifier wants and this is where i'm uh, this is what i this highlights what i am meant that to automate this selection step as part of an exchange uh, is more difficult as you introduce more options as if you if you would have every single step a sort of manual option that happened it would simplify things a lot right like think if you have, let's say this presentation exchange as an example, let's have a mobile wallet. I scan a presentation exchange and then I get a pop-up. It tells me which verification method would you like to use? These are the ones that the verifier will understand. This introduced a manual step in this process. I select it and then it sends, sends it along with that. So at this point I've provided this verification method ID without having it fully automated. What was automated is like telling me, finding which one matched the request, but selecting one, um, I guess you could just take the, the first one available that matched, that, that could be an option, but. Um, yeah, because in yeah. presentation exchange, the expected signature type or the, the algorithm is specified in the presentation exchange, right? Yeah, it's specified. Um, but you know, if you if you get uh, different cryptographic suites, maybe 
uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. Uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Yeah, but yeah, I think during an exchange, like there needs to be, uh, well, there doesn't need to be, but it's better if there's a stop at the part where the other party uh, needs to now engage with his component of the, the action. Right, like same thing for issuing a credential. When I get a, a credential offer, you know, in the wallet, I, me as the user, want to proactively say yes. I, I want to request this credential. Uh, it looks good to me. I want to request it. And I want it to be issued. Um, yeah. So, um, kind of swinging back around to the discussion that started this off is that process influenced by what we're using to identify the keys ultimately or is that just that we need to have a better way of selecting which mm. verification methods are used in presentation i think there something that's missing in the presentation exchange is the ability for the holder to select which verification method to use i don't think there's that ability yeah yet uh, at least not from what I've seen in Akapai. And um, it worked with did key because did key, you only have one choice, right? Like you, right. you only use your did key. Um, maybe this was made also because there is, um, you know, having did web for a subject of a credential has very strong privacy concerns here. So did key was maybe the, the default for a credential subject ID, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think, you know, with the diff presentation exchange, having the possibility to provide an optional verification method ID is a good thing to have. You don't have to use it. You know, there can be the automated process to exist, but yeah. that would make sense. Um, okay. And again, providing a verification method idea as an option does work well with this idea of binding multiple verification method ID with a key pair. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Right. Um, so I think that's I think it's clear that that's the direction we we want things to move. Um, there's still some uncertainty as to exactly how that needs to apply. To our, our current uh, representation of dibs, um, what can be, yeah, uh, the, uh, further analysis is required, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's some, like uh, in didcom v1, for instance, because we address messages to these ver keys, um, it, it might make sense for us to retain. The concept of a ver key in, in some capacity in order to, of course, continue our support for didcom v1. Um, but we can hopefully move that to be an exception um, where the rule is verification method IDs and, and more explicit identifiers for these keys based on dibs. Could, uh... Would having a multi-key still work with didcom v1? I, I feel like there would just need to be a little bit of a uh, I think the, the logic is um, like we could we could also technically swap the identifier used to address messages in didcom v1 to verification method IDs. Uh, there's nothing that like is that is that like a spec level thing, thing, thing or it's uh yeah that's I can buy code level thing. it's a it's ah a okay level thing. Yeah. yeah okay then I wouldn't change that yeah right. Yeah. So well, these, yeah, not everybody until everybody that supports did come be one would need to adopt the the update and move together as as a, like a community coordinated update, which I think is just um, difficult um, to accomplish. Um, and I, I think the did come community in general, uh, like if we're going to go through the trouble of updating the identifiers used, maybe we should just push on to did combi two where these yeah. have been solved. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't change did combi one. Um quick question. So we have the did info object, right? So the, the first yeah. place that my mind goes to is like, well, you know, we just had an array to the did info object with verification method IDs and it's sorted. 
but then you get into a sort of catch 22, right? That it's the, the method ID that needs to enable me to find the did info and not the did info that enables me to find the method ID. So how, how would you see that working? Just parse all the did info that exists and see if the verification method ID is in one of the lists or? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... Yeah, Do you know currently to have efficient lookup? Um, and yeah, yeah. Do you know, like currently, directions. how how do like let's say I give a ver key, how does it find the did info based on that ver key? Like, does it crawl to all the did infos and see if it matches one of them or? Uh, so, already existing within XPy is is a lookup mechanism from key to did. And then from did to connection, um, so that's that's something that's been established in order for us to, you know, hydrate the context of a didcom message. Mm -hmm. um, so in a context where we need to map from the key material to a did, I think we would probably just retain that that mapping. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, this is this is kind of. I think this is probably the most complicated part of of our anticipated did TDW support is uh, moving Akapai to a position where it more accurately represents modern conceptions of what it did is and, and what it is composed of, rather than being strictly of the mindset that it looks like indie NIMS with a single bird key attached to it. Um, yeah, and there's another like another thing to keep in mind is the Akapai is not the TDW server, right? Like it's right. not an Akapai that the did doc will live. So the relation, like the process to update my did doc and to manage my wallet, my keys in my wallet is two different things. They can be like made together with, with code. Like, you know, we can, Akapai can update its wallet and then find a mechanism to update the TDW server that holds the did documents, but there are two different things. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Um, indeed. Um, I think that actually transitions us pretty well into into your findings, Patrick, on on did web server. Um, did you want to share screen or anything like that, or? Uh, sure, I, I can share the screen. I, I uh, mostly going to show a bit the documentation of this. Uh, uh, pr project. I don't have a demo ready. I'm I'm still playing with it. I, you know, I've got an instance deployed, and I'm looking to uh, see how I can merge it a little bit more. So I can share today the idea, uh, the plan. I took some notes, some questions that I had for you. So something also that's interesting about TDW is it's um, moving away from a ledger, right? So I think the relationship between Akapai and a did web slash did TDW server and Akapai and in the ledger would be very similar. Um, so that's something interesting to keep in mind. Um, so this was, uh, it's actually Stefan Curran that, um, you know, brought this to our attention. And the goal is to model uh, the way Akapai will register did web with the way that this server is uh, designed. So in the did web specification, you know, there's this did management options. So you resolve a did, register a did, update a did, deactivate a did. It's, it's pretty simple, right? There's it's four operations. Uh, resolving a did. You know, it just means that the web server needs to be able to respond to a, you know, did web resolving call. That just means, you know, making the did.json files applicable at the correct place. So what I just want to go through today is to maybe quickly go over this and see, explain uh, how can this relate to a the endorser concept in Akapai. So there's the, the endorser concept is that you have a did that serves as an authority that will uh, sign a, a message on behalf of another party. 
and that endorser should have um, rights along with it. So it's like a, a bit of a privileged uh, did. Uh, it will have more permissions. Currently, this is tied to Indie. So when we talk about the author endorser transaction is that an author cannot write directly on the ledger unless this transaction has been approved by an endorser. Um, in the context of did web, uh, what the endorser will actually endorse as a transaction is uh, writing a did document on the web server. Uh, it's important that the did web server is different from your key management server, in my opinion, uh, for did web for and for TDW. The reason is that if you have a compromised server. Uh, they will less likely have access to your did documents as well as your key pairs. So I think having them as two very separate services makes a lot of sense. So the did web server, it's simple. It's a web server with a few HTTP API routes. The way that it works is you initialize your server with a did key. So you provide a did key. Um, so let's say in Akapai, I register a did key in my wallet, you know, local did. I use this did key as the startup parameter of my did web server. And this will be the root uh, did of the web server. And it will act as an endorser after the fact. From that point on, uh, when I want to register a did web, I provide my did web identifier. Uh, so a did web identifier is, uh, let me see if I can find an example somewhere, is the part that comes after the domain. So you have did web, uh, the domain name, and that's your core did. And then if you add another semicolon and you have a, like a half identifier. So the root domain would be the endorser and what becomes after the second semicolon or I don't know, tenants or something. The, the did like issuer dids that you want to use. The way it works to register a did, it works with uh, did auth. Uh, so we can see here, we started with, we provide a did key as the web server owner. Um, and then after that, when I want to create a did, what needs to happen is that the did web server will issue a credential using the did I want to create as the credential subject ID. And then the creden the did I want to register will then sign that in a presentation. So this is called did authentication. So you will get a presentation signed by the, the holder, which is the did I want to register. Uh, they give a bit of a weird example here, but um, and in that presentation, there's going to be a verifiable credential issued by the server or the endorser. I send that presentation as a post request to the register endpoint. And if the proofs are verifiable, it will create a did document uh, for my new did. So this is uh, the way it works. So my intention with this is to build this as the uh, Akapai process for registering a did web. That means when you start up Akapai, you will provide it a did web server URL, which could be this project or any server of your own. Uh, and then once that is done, um, whenever I choose to register a did web, it would be through a endorsement process. So I wouldn't, I would no longer be able to register an arbitrary did web string in Akapai. Uh, or maybe we can still make that as an optional, a sort of, you know, just provide a did as your own. But instead, uh, when I choose to register a did web, I provide the did web identifier. This, this is the part of the, uh, the identifier. Um, and then the Akapai, the, this process would know to get my uh, endorser did to sign a credential to that new identifier. And then that identifier would sign a presentation. Uh, so there's a bit of a 
one two step happening in which it needs to create the keeper and occupy, then sign that uh, credential with that key pair, send it back, and only then will my did web be resol resolvable. Uh, so for this exchange, this exchange need to happen with did keys. Um, and once these presentation with did keys have been exchanged, the did web will be resolvable serving that that did key, uh, multi-key and the did document. Um, did that explanation make sense to anyone? Um, do you have a link to this this, uh, this page that you could share with the chat? Yeah, I can share a link. There's a GitHub project. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to, where am I? Here. So this used the, the did authentication, which is a uh, fairly well-known exchange. Uh, some things I, I still need to sort of figure out is about uh, verification method key types. Um, in the example, they use JSON Web Key 2020. Um, well, I might not want to do that. So you can see here the issuer signs a credential and the issuer, I mean the did web server using the person did as the credential subject. So the, this is the person did, it's the, the document. And then the person then signed this into a presentation. So the credential subject of the initial, um, the initial credential is the did document that I wanna put on the ledger. So actually I should be able to put my own key type. Uh, the ID is the did web I intend to use. And then once this credential is signed, I sign it with my did that I wanna send over there send it to the registering endpoint. Um, and then if the proof verifies, it's gonna write that did document. Uh, to me, this makes a lot of sense to, and I can fairly well see this being a thing with Akapai currently. So a, a quick question. To just yeah. clarify, so the the issuance process, the the endorsement process, if you will, um, is something that happens out of band and isn't necessarily provided by the API of this did web server. So there's two ways you can configure this API web server to manage private keys. I think you can, or you can provide only the public key and have the out of band process. Uh, like you just described. So in my, the, the way I tend to implement this is that Akapai would manage all the issuance. Um, so I don't know if people here are familiar with Traction. Traction is a software by BCGov where I can make an account. It's based on the Akapai multi-tenant. Once I log in, I can create on the little button to publish a public did, and then an endorser will write my did on the ledger and I will have a did on the in the ledger. I would see the exact same thing as I want to say I want to publish my did web uh, and then the uh, the traction endorser will uh, create this um, uh, this credential and presentation, send it instead of sending it to the ledger, it's going to send it to the did web server. and then once that process is complete, I will have my um, my did web to use. Okay. Currently, so the currently the process is like I make a did web server. Well, I make a server. I host a did.json file that matches what I want. 
and then I just register that and I can apply. So it's sort of a low, uh, you know, it, it just relies on the, the user to sort of put these components in place as with this, it would be a more of a feature um, native to Icapi. And this did out process could just be implemented by anyone. Doesn't have to be this project, but I think that's a nice way to do it. So I'd like to provide that as a sort of default Icapi method to do so. Um, so to just briefly restate some of what you just said there. So what, what you're proposing is that in addition to this dip web server, uh, kind of coupled with the dip web server, there would be uh, an Akapai instance that actually performs the, the issuance of the credentials that are ultimately um, used to present and, and publish uh, the did on the did web server. Yeah. Okay. And this it's, is... the, it's the endorser that submits the, the final presentation to the did web server or is that go back to um, the, the... So that's the thing. Creator? In my design, uh, it's only one Akapai agent. This is will most likely be designed for multi-tenant agents. It could also work for a single tenant. Uh, because you can create as many local did as you want. Uh, but it would be a single Akapai instance uh, that plays the endorser in the did web. Because a key difference uh, with the ND endorsements, uh, you need to have either a multi-tenant agent or multiple agent because uh, the endorser dids are public dids published on the ledger. With this concept of uh, did web or local dids, like you don't, your did and, and according to Akapai, it doesn't need to be public, right? Akapai just needs to access the key pair. Uh, the, the did doc is actually on the web server. So the way I see this is you would have one agent uh, configured with a did web server endpoint. And then that agent would have uh, one key pair that acts as the endorser. And then whenever you want to register another key pair as it did web, it would go through this endorsement process. Um, would you see, would you see that endorsement process taking place over a protocol similar to the one that exists today for indie transactions? Or I would like that. that, yeah. Being... Okay. I would like that. I would I would probably, well, from my understanding of I could probably like, maybe there'd be like an Aries RFC or I don't know. Uh, but yeah, the, this should be like a protocol uh, embedded in Akapai, right? This should be like fairly automated um, because the agent will be already provisioned with the did web server endpoint. Um, so when I want to register a did web, I just provide um, the string I want to use as the, you know, like the last part of my did web. Um, or it could be generating a random UUID. Um, don't have preference and the, the web implementation I've done is the the sort of identifier is optional. If it's provided, it's gonna use the string as text value, otherwise it generates a UUID. Uh, something else interesting that I'm thinking about is to couple that with the uh, did in the registration. Uh, nothing prevents me from using my ND did as the sort of web shard at the end. So uh, what this gives me is I have a did web that is highly correlatable to a did ND did, and they could uh, even share the same key pairs, right? Uh, that's also something interesting for uh, mostly in the case of BC, right? When you have a, a, a ND ledger that is tied to a strong governance framework, and then you need to also provide a did web did for your dids, uh, so you could take an existing did ND uh, and, you know, with binding a verification method ID, just have a did web that corresponds to it. And so I thought that was like an interesting feature to have as well. Uh, 
Um, so something I noticed here, just um, looking at that VC value that's on the page you're looking at, um, there's no additional type beyond verifiable credential in the VC. Yeah. That kosher, <laughs> or it, it seems like there's generally going to be at least one value in addition to the verifiable credential type. Uh, it's recommended to have an additional one, but that's fine. Okay, so it's not strictly required. No. Interesting. I think Akapai might expect a at least one other credential type in its implementation of uh, Are you sure? the process. Are you yeah, sure? I'm, I'm speaking from memory, so I can't say that I'm totally sure, but that's that's somewhere in the back of my mind, at least. Yeah, let's see. Um, so we've got just a minute left. Does anybody have any questions for Patrick before we wrap up? It's not working. Uh... No, uh, you see. Interesting. Cool. Okay. Um, we will wrap up here for today. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks for your participation. Um, yeah, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.